What a great conversation we're having off air, and I feel like we have to go back on air now because uh, some of this stuff is so interesting. So we just, I, I asked a question off air expecting a very different answer than I got, uh, and that was, you know, when you, when you, so say, you know, you, you have someone who needs some sort of neurosurgery, they come to either, either one of the hospitals and the family and they meet you, uh, ladies, um, and, and, and I asked, you know, is it ever a, a situation where, you know, they would prefer to have a, a male neurosurgeon or they're a little bit apprehensive because you're females and both of you looked at me and were like, yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah, it, um, most of the time they would, uh, you would talk to them about the condition the patient has and they would say, let me give us some time to think about it. And some of them actually go talk to our teachers, our senior colleagues who are male. And some of them will be honest enough to come back and say, you know, I asked so and so and they said, yeah, it's okay. I can go ahead with the surgery with you. So we still, and this is a global problem. So we are still in a patriarchal society mm-hmm. where they don't think women can do this, but we are here to change that. So as I was, tol- I was telling you, we are now seeing more women in medical school, more women than men. But those coming to the surgical fields are still fewer so at neurosurgery we're only receiving five to six percent of this it's interesting you say that if if before today if someone was to met, say think of a neurosurgeon i would think of a man true i really would i think it's about the images that people put out i think if you if, if, if for example when people talk about kenya outside abroad you know people know more about the wildlife than they do about the people mm. and you think hey but there's 50 million of us come on did you miss that <laughs> yeah 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 so and, the, and, uh, <laughs> and, a lo- and a good percentage that need a neurosurgery yeah. at some point yeah yeah <laughs> So that's the same thing with, uh, so most of the uh, women surgeons, of course, are younger in terms of relative to their peers, the the male faculty. But we're here and we're also, com- you know, we, we've done the same exams, we've gone through the same rigmarole, but you still find that in our culture, uh, a lot of uh, leadership responsibility is assumed as male. So like the story I was telling you, uh, I talked to a patient and this is, as you know, I trained in, in, in the UK before I came here. It's no different. I'll go see a patient and then when I finish, they'll turn down to my student who's a guy, sometimes it's even a medical student, and said, so Dr. Ari, what do you think? And that's because we automatically assume that authority is vested mm. in the guy. Mm. Um, what we are fortunate for both of us is, you know, you can't get to this stage without mentorship and allyship. Yeah. We have had trainers and supporters, you know, those guys who are in uh, Gakan know that I work with Dr. Mugheri quite closely. And you can't succeed without, you know, the support of your male colleagues. So I couldn't have succeeded in Agakan without his support mm-hmm. and his mentorship. And the same is true for uh, Sylvia. Yeah, so I trained at University of Nairobi and my first mentor when I was an undergraduate was uh, a neurosurgeon, Dr. Kiboy. So when I came back for residency, I already knew him and I was also supported by my teachers, both at the University of Nairobi and Kenyatta National Hospital. And that has made a difference because they, they, hel- they hand held me, taught me my, all the skills I know, and it's been, it's been good. It takes a village to raise a neurosurgeon. True. It does. Now tell us a little bit about the, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons Foundation's future women leaders in neurosurgery scholarship. That is a mouthful, but I can imagine it must have been hard to be awarded that scholarship. So just a little bit of background. The Congress of Neurosurgeons is one of the biggest neurosurgical bodies uh, in the US, and they formed a foundation. And within it, they have the Women in Neurosurgery, which is celebrating 30 years this year. And so they got together and decided that they wanted to pipeline more women by supporting them in leadership, academia, research, and advocacy development. So they put out a call out for uh, this scholarship opportunity. And, you know, we're delighted to say that there were three people awarded that, an American lady and the two Kenyan girls that are talking here. So, you know, in the world, you know, two of them are Kenyans and we're really delighted about this opportunity. What that involves is we're both going to be attending the Congress in October and networking and learning. And both of us are going to go in different uh, leadership training uh, over the course of the year and hopefully, you know, use that to anchor and develop uh, you know, the position of women in neurosurgery. In, in okay, I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Congratulations for that. Yeah. That's huge. But Thank I have you. a question. Yes. Uh, and this is not on our list of questions. Okay? <laughs> so you're not going to know the question. Well, here we yeah. go. There are days I wake up and I'm just like, I don't really feel like doing my show this morning. It's not often, yeah. but once in a while on like a Wednesday or a Thursday and it's been a long weekend of work and I just wake up and I'm like, oh God, I got to go and do this thing. You guys can't have those days. Surely when you're dealing with someone's brain. <laughs> we can, we can. We are also big on work-life uh, balance. Right. So at the end of the day, like she said, we are between 35 and 37 neurosurgeons. So someone's life depends on you. Mm-hmm. And so if it's my day to work, I have to go. However, I make plans in such a way that I have days that I take off and I literally switch off my phone to take time to care of my children mm-hmm. and actually rest and rejuvenate so that when I come back, then I'm in a good state of mind and to help the people. And then also your mind changes, yeah? Mm-hmm. When you're called because of a patient... 
uh, especially because like you know for every minute that you lose in attending to somebody millions of brain cells are lost you just go into this auto drive there is that you know it's part of the training you just focus on the patient and mm-hmm. that's all that matters mm-hmm. so you could just leave everything on the outside on the periphery and just when you're operating yes. as a state of zen there is nothing that matters but what you're doing flow okay. now as as flow. as a woman yeah. there are certain biological realities <laughs> and uh, that is our womb yeah. our womb mm-hmm. now do you do you have children what was the decision behind having not having because that would that would take up your time your money your heart space all of these things that 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 plays into it surely so i'm a mother of three children wow. and i made the decision to have my first child during residency but i also understood the implications that uh, i lost time and also carrying the pregnancy over the nine months was a challenge so that's one of the things we talk about when we meet other women surgeons that yes you need to have children or you want to have children but you must understand that you may lag behind a little bit more than the mm. male colleagues but you'll catch up so if you get that that makes sense then you also need a good support system from your spouse and family because there'll be days my children need me and yet I'm at work so I have an excellent support system from my siblings my relatives who can step in even the school can call them and tell them you're unable to get Sylvia and they're able to attend to my children that's wonderful yes yeah. and when they are on uh, half term or they've closed school then I have to take time off to just spend time with them Okay. Now, when when you th- there obviously, you know, in your line of work, you have successes in what you do and you I don't want to call them failures, but there are probably times when you can't do you can't help someone as much as you would like to, you lose yeah. a patient, things like that. What is the process after uh, a, um, I'll just call it a tough day at the office? So, it depends what what we mean by a tough day. Sometimes it's really difficult discussions you're having with someone. Um, because first of all, unlike other forms of uh, medicine, nobody looks forward to meeting a neurosurgeon no, professionally. No, no. It's I'm actually, a, I'm no. not, I wasn't even looking forward to this conversation <laughs> on air. No. You know what I mean? No, yeah. I mean it's, we accept that it's a very s- stressful time, and that's why we tell people come with come with someone, you know, mm. to 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 hear you out. What do we do as professionals? You know, we we have to let off steam. Um, if it's an if it's a process or a problem that has happened within the hospitals, we have systems where we evaluate what has happened, but as individuals individuals we need to let off steam so mm. I, I like to go for walks I love to cook so if you find me cooking like 10,000 cakes that just means I need to get something off my mind <laughs> right um, we all have different outlets some people run um, but we are so there are two things that are very important a supportive uh, network outside of work mm-hmm. and you must cultivate that and something that you do to let your hair down and the second one is supportive colleagues because mm. you have to reflect with each other mm. and learn from what happened and work out what you're going to do the next time we still have challenges in terms of how people access our services a lot of times people come to us late in the game and that is really really sad mm. when you think you're around but people didn't know you're there or aren't able to afford so that's a wider conversation perhaps mm. for us to have about how do we find i mean how do we fund people and how do those people access our services so we can help them earlier on i have a really silly question i yeah. apologize in advance have you ever seen someone or could you see someone and and notice from externally oh there's something yes sometimes i walk really? on the streets and i'm like ah shall i go tell them no really <laughs> <laughs> Because neur- neurology is like the electrics of the system. You know, like when you when your when your when your laptop is not working. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, you walk on the street and you know, like you're walking and you look at that person. And you're saying um, that problem is on this part of the brain or this no part of the way. spinal cord. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it, it, those are awkward conversations to have on the street. <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, if you walked up and you're like, there's something not cr- quite right in your head, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I'm, I just need to let you know that we can help. No, I mean, especially I if you want to be a geek right. and now mention things like, oh, it's in your medulla oblongata yeah. or your pons or your where then people just get you like get a life there's there's, there's, uh, neurology memes coming up exactly but 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 more so more so when we talk about you know tough day at the office when when and i I don't know if this has happened to you i don't i don't know what the success rate is in your in your industry when you lose a patient that has to have a serious effect on 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 you as individuals and i i i'm just curious you know probably maybe no one else's but i'm just curious how you I mean, I'm sure that's all part of the medical school training, but what is the what is the what is the coping uh, strategy behind that? Because I mean, losing someone in your line of work, I mean, surely that must be a hard thing to to, to deal with. So, mo- as we said, most people don't want to come and see the neurosurgeons because what is bringing you to us is definitely they're affecting your brain or your spine. So, there are those patients we see, and we know we need to talk about end of life discussions. In our culture, death is not a conversation we like having. So that's that's the biggest challenge. The, the patients I struggle with are the trauma patients because this is someone who left their home okay. 
and then they are brought to you uh, you look at them and you know that chances of survival is almost minimal based on the injuries they've sustained so as she says we you evaluate this is you evaluate what this patient has is there a possibility of this patient being saved or not and if it's not if it's not possible for you to save a life it's a conversation you have to have with them relatives or the family members and it's tough for them to accept that uh, this has changed or this is going to happen it's also tough on us but as you continuously see them it, it's given me a totally different outlook on death mm. and acceptance mm. and learning to live now being to do what you need to do now because tomorrow is not assured even for you yeah. guys yes. exactly yes mm. I was, was going to make a comment also about that I think although there's a part of you that is about accepting what is within what you can change there's also that eternal optimism mm. when I was an intern I worked in a stroke unit and a third of the patients passed on we now have more therapies that is meaning that not only are people surviving but they are thriving you know so like for example in Aga Khan once again we do we have a dedicated stroke service that has every element that you need for that and so I am encouraged that whatever has happened now I ask myself what can we do better, better. and you know like uh, you know I was just laughing outside and saying it's a good thing that's still there and I are friends because we have a long career ahead of us mm-hmm. and you know within the group we talk to each other and we say how would you manage that next time mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. now this is the support system you speak yes. of yes yeah. so you just just the fact that you are six of 35 mm. six female of 35 Kenyan neurosurgeons or neurosurgeons in Kenya you are good news stories mm. what would you tell little girls or, or parents of little girls who want to go into medicine or neurosurgery <laughs> The first thing is I will ask parents to let the children choose for themselves. Mm. I think that um, it is fantastic to want to be a doctor, but the provision of healthcare is so much broader mm. than just being a doctor. You know, we have speech and language therapists, we have neurophysiologists. Neuro- I mean, there's so many, everything you can think of, there are people who do that. You know, re- I've, I've, since I've been getting involved in the media, people have been bringing their children. And the first thing I ask is, what is your child's true passion? It's it's not what is you know, accepted in society, but what is your child's true passion? That's where they will excel. That's where at three in the morning, they'll find the solutions to the problems that they're having. Um, But if you want to be a neurosurgeon, this is what you need to do at every stage. Take the opportunity to make the most of it. When you're in medical school, learn as much as you can. Because although we say neurosurgery is surgery, actually it is more medicine, some of which we operate. So you need to know a lot of general medicine to manage a neurosurgical patients. The second is reach out to us. Mm-hmm. Um, I think th- we were saying before, there are seven counties that have neurosurgeons. Those are uh, in Kisumu. Um, you have in Eldoret, the Moy Teaching Referral Hospital. You have in Nairobi, the public institutions, uh, like the University of Nairobi, that's Kenyatta. You, you've got in Kiambu, Thika Level 5, Embu, Nyeri also has uh, and the coast. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Which one have I missed? Ma- Kisumu. Uh, uh, Kisumu. So So you need to come and see what we actually do so that before you even start that journey, you have a better idea about what it involves and then put yourself out there. Don't give up trying and yeah, get in. And it also needs, you have to understand that neurosurgery is lifelong learning and the passion is really critical. And uh, we're also big on mentorship. So if you're considering doing neurosurgery, I mean, reach out to those neurosurgeons in those seven counties and get to see what they, what they do, how their lives look like, how, you know, how their days look like that, that gives you an image of what you're getting yourself into. Thank you so much for your time and for your work and for your for your just coming in and <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're busy so this is this is amazing that you came in yeah, what's to what does the rest of the day look like for you guys <laughs> just hanging out many, you know some yeah. cocktails you know yeah. whatever I've got an academic meeting uh, I've got to see a couple of patients and run a clinic uh, and then plan for surgery tomorrow Casual. Uh, yeah. me too uh, I've got to see patients today in preparation for theater tomorrow my goodness okay yeah. well uh, I don't know I don't know in our industry they say break a leg I don't want to I don't know what they say in your industry break, so break just leave it there with good luck yeah. tomorrow yeah. both of you yeah. Yeah, okay Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 11 minutes to 9. Good morning.